This podcast is brought to you by Vinzero. Vinzero pioneers solutions and services to the AEC and manufacturing industries to support net zero targets. Visit vinzero.com to learn more about how organisations design, build and solve through digitalisation. From Vinzero to you, welcome to our Think Future podcast series. Each week we'll share conversations with industry leaders from around the world to find out how they're thinking future. Subscribe to Vinzero Think Future for access to more episodes, interviews and profiles. Jason Howden is the Principal and Digital Innovation Leader for Warren and Marnie Architects. As an internationally sought after expert on technology in the built environment, he is the practices leader on all things BIM. For over 25 years, he's been at the forefront of the field, leading its development, promotion and education around the world. Jason has led project teams on some of the world's largest public service facilities in the UK, Australia and New Zealand, and is an innovative, strategic thinker, passionate about sustainable design empowered by integrated intelligent technologies. He believes together we can design a better and more sustainable built environment for our global communities. Welcome to the program, Jason. Welcome. Thank you for having me here today. Jason, let's start with your journey to Warren and Marnie. A really good question. At the time, I was living in in Australia and being in Sydney and away from home. I'm born and bred in in New Zealand, Kiwi. I was watching the news releases from uh, Christchurch. The the Christchurch earthquakes hit around 2011. And I felt compelled to be involved in the rebuild of Christchurch City. Um, And that led me on a a journey to Warren Amani. And one thing led to another. and, And I found myself in the middle of the Christchurch rebuild with Warren Amani and involved in some of the most uh, prominent uh, buildings that uh, came out of the rebuild and uh, have shaped the city, um, including the Justice Precinct, Convention Centre and Metro Sports. Um, So it was really fun. That certainly sounds like it would have been an interesting project. How is it you go about rebuilding a city at times like that? Incredibly challenging times. Warren Amani was involved in the original blueprint document that was the well, essentially the blueprint for a, a brand new city after the devastating earthquakes. That in itself was an amazing piece of work. I, I believe I wasn't involved in that. I was still in Australia when that was being done, but our team worked with lots of professionals and contractors and ministers of government. I, I understand it was like a, a hundred hour sprint to kind of come up with a blueprint to shape a new city and and have it on a essentially a plan on a page um, for redesigning and a whole new city and that included 16 anchor projects that would kickstart the investment after the devastating earthquakes and I was fortunate enough to work on I think almost half of them which is an amazing opportunity for anyone's career to be involved in uh, city shaping at such a large scale but I guess more importantly to implement BIM as part of that and to leave a digital legacy not only the built legacy for many generations to come. And would it be fair to say that the consideration of those projects, there was a lot of focus around resilient design? Absolutely. The response going forward, it was very fresh in our mind what had happened with the earthquakes. I remember arriving from Australia to Christchurch in New Zealand and we were still receiving significant aftershocks. Uh, Earthquakes and the high fives, low sixes was a common occurrence. So we were on a a daily reminder that we're visitors on this planet and the planet has got forces that can influence the entire city in a moment. So um, building the resilience into the new city infrastructure was was top of mind and I, I learned a whole new almost design discipline around how to respond to seismically resilient buildings and having a building that is able to accommodate earth movement of uh, six or seven hundred millimetres is a whole art in itself and the science and the technology that has been developed actually here in New Zealand to create base isolating buildings or by base isolated buildings is fascinating in itself. So what do you consider the difference between resilient design and sustainable design? They actually go hand in glove. A resilient building, I feel, needs to be a sustainable building in itself. I guess they're not mutually inclusive of each other, but that they do respond to each other. Climate change and 
the responses that we need to take, it also creates a resilient building. The, the resilience that you get from a responding to, say, an earthquake is, is one thing. Being able to have a building that is safe and occupiable after a significant event like that is is one thing but also having a building that can respond to the incremental changes that climate change is posing on on the the i guess the natural environment and noting that a building will be standing for 50 60 70 years it's going to go through some significant changes as temperatures rise wind um, speeds increase rainfall actually increases the sizing of our gutters, let's say particularly internal gutters, might need to double or triple in size. So being able to understand that, predict that and design that in so you have a resilient building to respond to climate change is an emerging field that I think we'll we'll see evolving. So talk to us about what sustainable design means to Warren and Marnie. 2020 um, marked a pivotal year um, for the globe and for Warren and Money. Um, whether we made a, a climate commitment, a carbon commitment ourselves, uh, to reduce our embodied and carbon within our new designs with our clients by 40% and to improve the operational efficiency of our buildings by 50% that we designed. So the sustainability at Warren and Money is a core fundamental and we use technology to help inform that decision making as we embark on our designs. So I know that they say sustainability isn't an isolated dimension of a project. What does that actually mean though? There's multiple dimensions to a building project. They're not just a three-dimensional component that lives on the planet. They live within the planet and the people who inhabit them and create them. So there's multiple dimensions to the sustainability, whether it is inclusive design or co-design with the Indigenous people or responding to the natural environment that may have been lost or forgotten as part of the urban development that has kind of grown up around our um, cities and and built environment. So there's many parts to it. And it's not just thinking about the thermal performance, the embodied carbon or the operational efficiency, it's orientation, it's uh, natural ventilation. And it's just the feeling that you get when you go into a, a modern building these days. So what sort of expertise does it take to deliver a a true sustainable project for Warren and Marnie? A oh, very good question. A lot of expertise. It, it's construction expertise, design expertise, uh, technology and digital expertise, and and dedicated expertise on understanding how we respond to the impacts of climate change um, from analysing embodied carbon, um, which is an emerging field. We actually have a PhD student working with us doing dedicated research into uh, what it takes to design low carbon carbon buildings going forward and to help us meet our climate commitment that we've promised to deliver on with our clients. It'll be really interesting to see what comes out of that insight. Um, Early indications are it is possible to achieve our commitment and with respecting a a timber first and enhancing design principles that have um, been part of our fabric for many years through digital tools, we're going to achieve these goals. You're certainly describing a really collaborative process there. Are you able to provide a recent example of where you've utilised construction, design and digital expertise to collaborate on a project? Oh, wow. Yes, I'm currently working on a project that is being designed to house and protect New Zealand's national treasures, the Hikirua Archives Project. It's our new national archives in Wellington, and it combines co-design with the Indigenous people of New Zealand, the local iwi, and they've had a huge um, input into the fundamental characteristics of the design and shaping of the project. Sustainability is featured heavily in the project um, because of this activity and commitment to climate and also the resilience of the building is above and beyond anything that I've um, worked on. 
the building is designed to withstand a, a one in fifteen hundred year event. So it, it's over a very, very long time period. And being able to use digital technologies to bring all of this to life from Rhino and a grasshopper to use computational design processes to model in three dimensions the indigenous pattern on the facade all the way through to using BIM and tools like Revisto to bring the entire team together around a digital environment that is online and collaborative to de-risk the project from unforeseen coordination issues to creating a foundational legacy of digital information to have a functional digital twin that the tenants can use as part of the operation and facilities management of the building throughout its lifetime. So what type of experience or expertise does it really take to deliver on that type of project? It's a large team and a, a large pool of experience has come together to deliver a project like that from sustainability professionals to uh, our cultural design team, um, our advanced BIM team, um, all the way through to the contractors and the, the sub-trades that they employ as well as the cost consultants and the specialist AM and FM advisors and peer reviewers from even as far afield as uh, North America to ensure that our response to the resilience requirements around the seismic issues are meeting the performance briefs of our client and the tenant. After all, we are protecting the nation's treasures and it's really important to us. And outside of that project, Warren and Marnie regularly engage with a variety of subject matter experts. You mentioned you have a PhD student on board. Yes, Emily Newmarch is working with us. She's currently uh, undertaking a PhD in low carbon um, design. And, and it's been fascinating to be working with Emily and to have worked with her over the last couple of years through a, a PhD level uh, research project, particularly focused on embodied carbon analysis measurement and the application of that going forward um, in the design of our new projects that we bring to life for our clients. The insight that we're gaining from that research is just really kind of transforming the way we think about the built environment, um, how we might utilize emerging materials and innovation for design for manufacture, particularly in the timber first space is groundbreaking and it's pretty exciting to be a part of that and to be leveraging the BIM data data that we prepare as part of our ongoing design commissions directly into that work. So can we just unpack that a little bit further? You mentioned low carbon designs. What are some of the trends you're seeing emerging here, particularly in reference to low carbon projects you may have and the use of sustainable materials, for example? Yeah, some of the, the big trends that we're seeing, particularly in New Zealand, is um, a real shift towards mass timber, um, CLT, LVL. Um, it is growing exponentially and it's pretty exciting to see this really deep understanding of what it means to ensure that we have a sustainable ecosystem for construction going forward and at the same time protect our environment. There's a, a much greater awareness around the impact concrete has or more specifically the manufacturing of cement for concrete inside our built environment has and if we can mitigate that and replace that with an alternative like mass timber, the positive advantages that you have firstly on the environment, but secondly on the people who inhabit the buildings, there's a lot of research coming through that suggests that if there's a lot of exposed natural timbers, it actually makes a, a, a space feel more comfortable. So that's that's pretty exciting to see as well. And Jason, it's not just about timber. There's also the opportunity to integrate cork, for example, as a sustainable material. Yeah, cork is, is something that I've been following um, online and, you know, championing with people here in New Zealand as well. Cork has some special properties, particularly expanded cork. When cork granules are um, superheated with steam, they expand a bit like popcorn and the natural resins that are produced bind and hold the cork together and you can form it in a 
essentially a very large cake tin and then afterwards slice it up and it becomes a really incredibly efficient, the properties of it for thermal performance are really high. For an inch of cork, you can get an R3.2, which would be equivalent to say four inches of fiberglass insulation. So there's some real exponential performance gains by embracing the natural world again. And I think this um, convergence that I see with the digital analytics that we can do to predict the demand for thermal performance in the built environment combined with our responses that we need to take to minimize the impact on the environment together with this deeper understanding of you know how important and how great the natural environment already is and bringing them together to create a built environment that is more sustainable higher performing and in the process of assembling that building we're sequestering carbon that has been harvested by trees and and locking it up in buildings that might stand for 50, 80, 100 years going forward. And I think we're seeing a, a real renaissance and a, an emergence of a new craft and a new architecture as we advance. Are you looking for a digitalisation and net zero partner to help you achieve your goals? Join the thousands of AEC and manufacturing customers globally who have turned to VinZero to start their journey toward a net zero future. With 32 offices around the world, VinZero can connect you to the right technologies and workflow processes, so you can maintain your competitive position and increase profitability. VinZero has an industry expert to help you navigate the best pathway forward, wherever you are on your digitalization and net zero journey. Visit VinZero.com to find out more. And of course, there's another big focus emerging now for the built environment with adaptive reuse projects as well. Yeah, and how can we reuse the steel and concrete buildings that we've created? They're they're wonderful structures. We don't need to tear them down and put them in landfill. How can we peel them back and refresh them for a a new life, a new purpose for the next 50 years? And that's where I get pretty excited about the range of emerging technologies in the scan to BIM space. You know, a few years ago, we invested in our own laser scanner and we've used it on it numerous buildings up and down the country and as far afield as Australia. But now you can actually have a laser scanner that's combined with a drone. So the technology every day is just changing so fast. It's getting better. It's getting faster. It's getting easier to use. And it's also getting cheaper. So the things that we'll be able to do as we advance forward in this space by embracing technology just really excites me. So how does the application of digital help us design for deconstruction? If we're creating our designs using the BIM processes from the get-go, we can start to include metadata inside the digital objects, that essentially the prototype of the built thing that will come later. And some of that metadata might be information on how to deconstruct a building or the order that you might deconstruct a building. Maybe it's as simple as providing some information around the tools or maybe the health and safety measures that you might need to consider uh, in demounting a wall. Or it could go as far as prototyping and manufacturing the wall so it's deconstructable. Another exciting New Zealand company called X-Frame have used digital tools together with plywood to essentially make partitioning demountable and reusable and you need very very little fixings no glue it's kind of think of timber lego uh, for construction and you can create the framing uh, very quickly on site and then you can line it and then you can take the linings off and you can uh, demount this framing and and reuse it on another project or reuse it in another part of your existing project so digital is enabling data and design to test and assess adaptive reuse before it actually happens. Absolutely. And um, I'm seeing emerging trends around um, the gamification of, I guess, the design industry that I work within. Tools like Unreal Engine allow us to essentially combine real world physics at a city scale and to run simulations on what might happen, run an earthquake simulation and see how a building might respond and go as far as potentially showing how the facade might 
wobble or hold itself together or will parts of the facade fall off if the earthquake is strong enough, etc. That kind of um, emerging trend where we're starting to see this simulated world through the digital environment is coming at, at a very rapid pace. And I guess what excites me the most is my children think I come to work to play video games. My children play video games, but I can see a world where they have careers using gaming technology and they'll be experts at it because they've spent their life playing video games so they know the software and the technology inside and out already. So can you share with us some practical examples as well of how you see technology is delivering on sustainability, for example, increasing our understanding or ability to manage emissions, for instance? Through the work that we've been doing with Emily and her PhD research, that we were able to, to get Autodesk together with our preferred software partner, OneClick LCA, from a, an analysis and a measurement of embodied carbon and combine essentially those giants of the technology world together to take a really deep exploration in what it means to assess and measure embodied carbon and then roll that out across multiple projects using the Autodesk Forge platform is is our vision going forward. And, And that kind of partnership and collaboration between technology providers and industry experts and professionals who use the technology to really drill into how technology is can be used and shaped to provide a more sustainable outcome uh, through the work that we do in our designing the built environment for our clients is really empowering and to see how we can use these tools and the response that you get from the designers and the clients when they can see the data and know that the data is robust and trustworthy because it's been assembled by scientists who are working in deeply in the field of carbon analysis and it's combined with the geometry from our BIM models and we know that we've counted the carbon the right way and we can see apples for apples from a carbon perspective is incredibly empowering for our clients to know essentially the weight of their building and what kind of footprint it has long before any piles have been driven, foundations been laid, let alone a building being open for operations. And I know we, we touched on it before, but again, I'd like to call out and congratulate Warren and Marnie for its own effort as a zero carbon operation. Share with us a little bit more about that journey. We've been a zero carbon certified for over a decade. The Warren Money have believed in a, a sustainable response for a very long time. And that just reflects throughout all of our operations, all of our flights are measured and offset. And we've invested in a, a number of key initiatives up and down the country for native regeneration of our natural and native forests, which is really empowering, including days where staff have gone out and helped to plant and seed new forests on the Banks Peninsula in Canterbury. It's really dear to our heart and it goes across all facets of the business and including as far as real-time energy metering of the electricity that we use in our Christchurch studio and then connecting that back to our our BIM environment so we can start to understand and analyse how our daily operations utilise energy and how we might be able to make subtle shifts in reducing that impact depending on environmental changes that are happening outside. The core belief that we all share at Warren Amani is a, a respect for our commitment to our response to climate change. That commitment is part of a, a mantra that we have and as part of that, we understand that the impact that we can have as an individual can go so far. We can choose to not drive the car and take the bus or to take the keep cup as opposed to have a takeaway cup when we get our morning coffee. And that impact goes you know, that far. But through our work, our impact and our influence greatly dwarfs that. And through our deep understanding and utilization of BIM and the data that we're capturing in our project files, combined with the rich analytics that we're getting from one click LCA, we're able to understand what that impact 
is going forward. We've been working on some projects where the reductions that we've made are equivalent to taking 3,000 cars off the road. And that's exponential when you think of the scale of Warren Amani. Um, we have 400 staff. We work on hundreds of projects in Australia and New Zealand and around the Pacific Rim every year. And if every project was taking 3,000 cars off the road, that's a huge impact, much greater than the 400 uh, of us all riding our bikes to work. So what are the biggest problems you see now that still need to be solved for the built environment? That's a really challenging question. And I have a lot of passion for the built environment, almost three decades in the making in the built environment. Every day is another learning day. Some of the challenges that we'll face, absolutely climate change is going to be a huge challenge. And uh, the response is that we will innovate to respond to that. It will really challenge us to think outside the box at every aspect you know, just designing a gutter for resilience over a 50 year period when the rainfall was going to increase potentially exponentially. And how do you do that? So it was going to take everybody to come together to understand how we will design a better built environment going forward. And more importantly, how can we take those learnings and share that with the custodians of the current built environment so we don't leave our, our current world behind and try and create a new world because the planet is finite and we can't rebuild the entire world again because that would be the worst thing for climate change. We need to work together and I think therein lies uh, the biggest opportunity of collaborating, sharing knowledge leveraging the digital environment to empower that, leveraging tools like Web 3.0, uh, the future metaverse, uh, so we can share knowledge and express the human creativity and take that to a new level in partnership with the contractors and the builders that are going to be building what we design. So really it's about, amongst many other things, building more with less. Absolutely. And I am really excited about the future. And I think, you know, that we're on the cusp of a, a new renaissance where quality over quantity is going to be um, the popular talking point. And that will empower us to really take design and the craftsmanship that's behind that design to another level and truly respect it. Let's challenge ourselves to design a building that will last 100 years, not 30 and design it to the level that it will stand there and be timeless for a hundred years. What an amazing challenge to undertake. I'd love to work on a, on a project where that was one of the brief criteria that this project must last for a hundred years and to work through the details, to use the digital tools to simulate and prototype and give our clients and the project teams and project partners the confidence that what we are creating today will still be there in 100 years time. And I know you're very passionate about collaboration. So I think you've talked about it before in terms of digital alignment and how you actually work with organisations to help get all the key stakeholders aligned in that type of new future and in that type of challenge that's going to become even more important. What advice do you have for organisations in terms of how to get alignment? Talk to each other. You cannot... Um overstate the importance of talking to each other, whether you're talking via Teams or whether you're in a room together. Um, communication, collaboration is at the heart of everything that we do in the built environment and championing and elevating the art of collaborating clearly amongst each other is one of those kind of fundamentals that you've got to get right. Parallel to that, aligning your digital environment as much as you can so you can seamlessly work and share the knowledge that you create as part of the process of designing or constructing a building is key to getting the return on that investment. And, you know, lastly, lean into the innovation that is coming in this space. What a wonderful almost excuse to, to engage with the next generation of augmented reality glasses or headsets that come from Apple because you can go to site, you can wear them and you can see the future installation of a plant room before you go and have to install that plant room for real. 
It's so great to hear your passion for the built environment and the role of technology. So as we close out our podcast today, let me ask you, with so much exposure to technology and innovation, when you think future, what excites you the most? I touched on it before around the gamification of the uh, of our industry. I think I'm most excited about the potential of WebPoint uh, 3.0 and the metaverse and what that might mean. I'm seeing a number of converging trends around, predominantly around Unreal Engine. The recent partnership between Epic and Autodesk is a, potentially a game changer. We've got the largest technology provider to the built environment partnering with the largest developer for the gaming environment coming together and that convergence of super scaled digital tools is is just mind-blowing and I think a huge opportunity. If you can have a virtual conference in Fortnite where 10 million people come together and collaborate and dance to a a, a rap concert, just imagine what you could do in the built environment if you can have the entire project team assembling and and commenting and working through a prototype of a a building um, from contractors to plumbers, um, from clients and stakeholders all coming together uh, to me, that, that, that feels like an, a magical time where um, the vision, the dream that we had for BIM 20 years ago is suddenly realized and we're on the cusp of having the, the tools to deliver it. I would encourage the people behind the tools because they are the most important component to embrace the emerging tools, trends, technologies, it's only going to give us superpowers. The robots aren't coming to take our jobs just yet. We've got plenty of time ahead to design a better future. And I'm sure, Jason, you're going to be leading the steps all the way. So we definitely look forward to having you back on the program in the future and hearing about how you and Warren and Marnie have engaged with some of those innovations. Thanks for joining us. Thank you again. It's been a pleasure. This podcast was brought to you by VinZero. VinZero helped the AEC and manufacturing industries keep pace with digital change and achieve their technological and sustainability leadership goals. VinZero is a company that cares about creating and building a better world. Together, we are working with industry and environmental experts, providing forums and platforms through our VinZero Think community to create conversations that matter to our future generations. We invite you to join in the conversation and participate in our Think community. Like and subscribe to Think Future to stay up to date with the latest innovations and conversations as we take AEC and manufacturing around the world closer to zero. You can download our podcasts at vinzero.com or from your favourite podcast platform. From Vinzero Think Future, thanks for listening.